Being an entrepreneur in an emerging market, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Nigeria, you know, that's a whole different level <laughs> of yeah. entrepreneurship. I, I think there's something about the Levant region, and I think it's because there's so many wars and people have been uprooted, Syrian and uh, Jordanian, Lebanese and Palestinian. I mean, they're some of the best entrepreneurs in the region. Just because somebody gives you money doesn't mean that that's the right fit. The right fit. Hello and welcome to another episode of Alchemy of Transformation podcast. Here we discover the essence of why things the way they, uh, they are. Today we are going to discuss and have a deep dive into the Middle East uh, venture capital markets through someone who has been very experienced uh, in the last decade uh, in the MENA region. Uh, venture is something which is seen as an enigma, as a mystery and something uh, that in the West uh, people are very familiar with or, or people think that it can only happen in the West. But now recently we have seen both UAE, Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, even in Asia, venture investing has become not only mainstream, but it has caught the fascination of both the government as well as the youth um, and the corporate sector. To help find us what is me happening in the MENA venture capital and the startup space? What are the do's and don'ts? And what are the survival tips? We have someone who has the right person uh, to help us navigate through that. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Walid. How are you doing? Hi, Ahmed. I'm uh, doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's great. And it's great since you have come from the US, a long trip yesterday. <laughs> you, you, do, you don't look jet lagged at all. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't able to sleep in the US. I think I still stayed in Middle East time the whole time I was there for 10 days so when I came back I was okay <laughs> I can imagine I can, you, there is a way to do that it takes a big toll on your body but but you can do that true, true. so Walid uh, you've been an, um, you've been a big um, presence in the MENA venture capital space and not many people know about it but the starting scene was not Dubai it was in fact Amman it was a company called Maktoub and you were very intrinsically involved with that so you've been part of MENA venture partners uh, earlier on and uh, then you were also the chief operating officer of Vamda. Vamda is in essence the uh, on celebration of entrepreneurship if you remember that's where it all started <laughs> yes, and remember. Vamda was the content platform your COO of that and then the partner at Vamda Capital the 70 million dollar fund um, and then you've invested in some of the most uh, most famous most named uh, startups who have exited and now you're part of uh, MSA Capital which is a $2 billion fund um, and now the chief operating officer for MSA Novo uh, which is the global emerging markets fund of MSA capital of China so it's been quite a journey so how how did you get here where did it start tell us about those days in Amman uh, caught in traffic in the summer because I've also lived in Amman and sure. dreaming about venture and startups how did it all begin? Sure. Thank you so much, Ahmed. And I really appreciate you having me here and uh, for your audience for tuning in and hopefully getting the insights about the venture capital um, landscape of what's happening in the MENA region specifically, where I've spent most of my time and most of my experience. Um, I will bring a story of the alchemy of self and where it all started for me a little bit. Uh, we have to go back in time a little bit further than Jordan and start maybe with my parents a little bit. Oh, nice. Um, my dad has been through four exiles in his life. So he came from Palestine, went to Jordan, went to Libya, went to Kuwait, came back to Jordan, spent some time in Syria. Uh, life was difficult mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Uh, there's a lot of times where you have to reinvent yourself and restart. And I think that that's where the essence of entrepreneurship comes from, right? That need for survival, that need to feed your family, that need to self-actualize and create something uh, that is good for you, good for the community, and also has a positive impact on your family. And that's kind of the environment that I grew up in. From a very early age, I was born in Kuwait. My dad was an entrepreneur. He worked uh, in a cosmetics company, uh, bringing different brands to Kuwait, and then started his own business um, doing uh, uh, confectionery. My mother then started a fashion label and, uh, uh, and basically getting dresses and selling them in the fashion industry and then into jewelry. So 
Being a kid growing up in an environment where both your mother and your father are entrepreneurs and working really puts something inside you. It makes you kind of understand life from a different angle. Things are not always safe. Things are very exciting. And I remember from my earliest years, I used to help out because the whole family used to help out. I have three older sisters and they also became entrepreneurs themselves. And my wife today, she's an entrepreneur. So I feel I've been you know, galvanized in the environment of entrepreneurship and I find it extremely exciting. Um, I left Kuwait for the Gulf War. I spent some time in Jordan. I did my high school there. And then I moved to Montreal, Canada, where I spent 11 years. Mm -hmm. And there my dream was to become a musician. Not a lot of people know that about me, but I've played music professionally for 10 years. Wow. And the bug of entrepreneurship coming from my youth uh, clearly was very evident because I led the band in artist management. We got signed to an independent label out of oh, New wow. York. Wow. And it's very guerrilla style marketing, which means you put up posters, you try to sell tickets to your concerts, you you know produce uh, uh, CDs. At the time it was CDs, there wasn't any MP3s. Um, and you try to build a name for yourself, market yourself. And that's why I did my undergrad in marketing. My idea was, you know, how can I use um, marketing tools to be able to become successful. So in my youth, I worked with my parents, I worked with my uncle as well, who's an entrepreneur, and then I started my uh, music career, my dream to be uh, a musician. That didn't work out the way I wanted, so I also established a non-for-profit organization around uh, yoga, dance, and music. Um, I was very interested in bringing communities together, um, and then decided to do my MBA at the American University of Beirut. And I had an idea of a startup business and Mr. Fadi Randur, who is the well-known infamous entrepreneur from the region, the founder of Aramex, the first Arab company to go public on NASDAQ, was giving a talk about CSR about, uh, at the American University of Beirut while I was attending there and doing my MBA. Wow. So that was the initial spark that I had to go and introduce myself to Fadi. I actually went after his talk. It was in a theater. There was a lineup of people mm. that want to meet Fadi, as is usually the case wherever mm. he shows up. He's a rock star. He's an amazing rock star <laughs> and an amazing human yeah, being. Yeah, yeah. And as successful as he is on the business side, his giving back and, and care about the community and philanthropic side is really what attracted me to this human being who is completely uh, holistic in his way of doing things. And you did not find a lot of business leaders that had both of these characteristics. You had business leaders that were very successful, but it was questionable about the ways that they achieved that success or created enemies along the way. Fadi, on the other hand, was loved by everybody that I know and was extremely successful both on the social side and on the investment and business side. So I went and I introduced myself and I, I, I introduced myself as a Jordanian. And he said, great, when you're in Jordan, why don't you come and have a cup of coffee with me? Wow. So early in the Facebook days, I got into Facebook, I befriended him. And I texted him, I think, at six or seven in the morning. And if you know anything about Fadi, he's an early riser and he gets most of his work done in the morning. I just happened to be at the right time. I got his <laughs> attention. Uh, and then I went and I had a cup of coffee. And, um, you know, I had a business plan, so I gave it to him. But I also put in my CV. And he questioned why my CV was there. And I said, in case you are interested in my credentials, I'm finishing off my MBA this year. Uh, you know, if you have something for me, I'd be interested to work with you. I think it took a week and he said, how would you like to manage my personal investments? At the time I was finishing off my MBA, but I was also working as a uh, WMS expert at a, a distribution company in Jordan, oh, okay. um, uh, uh, helping them create the WMS, which is the warehouse management system for their logistics and their distribution. And it was very, you know, I was interested in what Aramex was and what Fadi built in Aramex. So for him to come and give me the opportunity, uh, literally out of nowhere, just because of trust and just because of friendship, 
to manage his personal investments, I was blown away. This is 2009, and this is a landmark year in the evolution of the venture capital hmm. story in the Middle East, because that's the year that Yahoo bought Mektoub for around $165 million. So it was the first time that a tech company in the Arab world had built, some, built something hmm. of value, hmm. where an international company, a US company, has come and acquired it, and finally the model, of we can actually build something of value that can get a sizable exit, created this enormous ripple effect that started, I think, was ground zero of starting everything. So it was with Fadi, believing in uh, Hussam and Samih, the founders of Maktoub, um, and that really created an awakening. Several things happened during that time. Um, I came in and Fadi uh, uh, you know, said, let's start investing in entrepreneurs. And I've, he had already invested in a few uh, companies. We put it under a vehicle called Mina Venture Investments. Small ticket sizes, 150K, 250K, just trying to understand what's happening in our region, but also investing in global funds uh, and in global companies. We didn't think that we would only invest in technology. It was actually a greenfield opportunistic kind of fund, but a lot of the investments came into technology. The opportunity of it, what presented itself was tech-based. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can uh, invest in something that's traditional, but the exciting stuff and the stuff that was scaling and the stuff that was making impact yeah. was really around the technology space. So what ended up happening is we invested in over 100 companies, a few funds, um, and it was an extremely successful story. Not only did you have the Yahoo Maktoub exit, you had the Su Amazon exit that wow. came from the fund. Mm. You had Yemek Sepeti, which is a Turkish company that got out by, got bought out by Delivery Hero. Mm. Um, and really, we were just at the right place at the right time for some of the biggest exits that happened uh, in the Middle East venture capital uh, space. You had mentioned Wamda. Wamda started as a content platform to educate people about entrepreneurship. So yes. there is a choice for youth mm to not necessarily take a government job or a corporate job, but actually to create their own job, to create their own business, to go after their own ideas mm -hmm. and really start their own path. And we wanted to create that in the Middle East because, you know, the fear of failure, as I'm sure in Pakistan and different places, you know, you come and you take people, uh, people's money, either your friends or your family, and you start something and you fail, you become the black sheep of the family, you become, you know, excommunicated, and it's very difficult. And it's very difficult to take that step or that leap of faith. We wanted to change that attitude in the Middle East. And so we spoke about stories of entrepreneurs, we spoke about funding stories, and to change the mindset of what was happening uh, in the MENA region, which I think WAMDA did a fantastic job. Because a lot of Corporates and governments came to WAMDA to say, how can we engage with entrepreneurs? How can we support entrepreneurs? How can we be part of the story rather than be disrupted and be the company that you know wasn't innovative enough to do something to continue? Mm -hmm. So WAMDA was a fantastic uh, uh, story. Uh, in 2015, we established one of the first GPLP structures. Uh, it was a $70 million fund anchored by the IFC. We invested up to $5 million, so up to the Series A. Mm -hmm. uh, we invested in around 25 companies, and one of them was Kareem, of course, yes. which got up, bought out by Uber for around $3.2 billion. Mm -hmm. um, and then I finished my tenure uh, uh, in around 2019 with Fadi and the incredible track record that he has, and I moved to MSA Capital. The idea was how can we get, or my, my intention was how to consciously choose to find global money and investors to come and invest in the MENA region. Okay. If you take a look at venture capital, mm -hmm. it started in, in, in the States and maybe moved into Europe and then got into uh, for the Far East. India, Correct. Yes, yeah. But really hasn't looked a lot at no, Africa absolutely. and the Middle East and, and some places. Absolutely. And companies, when they scale, they look at the US, they look at Europe, and maybe at the 10th or 11th tier, maybe they'll think about the MENA region. The MENA region has been notorious with wars, 
political instability. The Arab Spring. The Arab Spring. Right happening in the middle. So the Arab Spring was a big awakening <laughs> that happened. It was the same time that I, I met Fadi. <laughs> and we started investing in companies. And we really felt that the youth were no longer going to be uh, uh, silenced. Mm. They were no longer going to be, you know, uh, subject to things that they don't want. And they wanted to be their own authorities. The main story in the Arab Spring and the main story at that time was how technology started to enable people to communicate, share ideas, and literally scale what they wanted and demanded certain services uh, uh, and products that they were no longer not going to get. Yes. Um, I remember early on, I was thinking, you know, is it important to have a Twitter account? Is it important to, you know, be on all of these social media platforms? And the Arab Spring, you know, gave you a, a astounding answer that, yes, yes this is did. power now. Yeah. This is no longer just a fun thing to have on your mobile. This is how you connect. This is how you get uh, uh, new philosophies, new ideologies out and to create a movement. So it was actually uh, a very uh, important step in, in what has happened. As everybody looked towards the West, and specifically towards the States, as a model of success for venture capital and for money coming in, the amount of exits that were happening in the MENA region were very few Bayfield. and far between. Yes. And I remember when we established the WAMDA Fund, you know, one of the main questions that our funders and our LPs, our limited partners who invested in the fund asked was, where are you going to get the exits from? You know, you're in a geography that is marred by political instability, very difficult to scale because you're scattered into 22 countries in the Arab world. You know, how, who's going to buy you? Where are you going to get your funds from? Um, and to wait for an American company to come and acquire something, as we saw with Yahoo, and then we saw with Uber, and we saw with Amazon, was literally happening once every, you know, five to eight years, which was not creating the kind of velocity and turnover that you needed. So I decided to take a look at what was happening in India, India, Indonesia, Singapore, and China. I thought that the East was doing something fantastic as they were growing and creating these incredible businesses that were probably closer to our DNA in the Middle East mm -hmm. than what we saw in the US and, 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 and Silicon Valley. If you're an entrepreneur in the US or Europe, you can establish your company, you can be very focused on what you're doing, and you can get acquired by the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks, the IBMs, etc. In the Middle East, it's not that way. You have to be able to really think outside of the box and to create incredible business models that sustain you long enough, yes. and you have enough cash flow to stay alive and scale properly for one of these companies to come in. So what was happening in China? What was happening in the East that maybe we can learn from? I met MSA Capital, oddly enough, because we were fundraising for a new WAMDA fund and the uh, GPs of MSA were investing, interested to invest in the WAMDA vehicle. Okay. That's where the initial connection uh, came and that's when I spun off and I said, look, I'm very interested in what's happening in China. Mm -hmm. Clearly, your entrepreneurs are doing great because MSA in 2018 had six IPOs for their, their, you know, their sector leaders in every single industry that they've invested in. So they invested in Mobike, they invested in Meituan, last mile delivery, they invested yeah. in NIO, which yeah. is uh, the electric car company. Mm -hmm. They've invested in BGI, which is gene sequencing, genomics. Um, and it was amazing what their track record was for a vintage uh, fund in 2015. Mm -hmm. At the time that I met them in, within four years, they had nine exits nine unicorns, we had one in MENA region, which was Karim, wow. which I would argue has not really replicated in a way that mm. we thought, even though we're 2023 today. Um, so the idea was, how can we take business models from China that have scaled successfully, and how can we adapt them to some of the companies that we've invested in the Middle East? Um, and really there... Um, is where the story of MSA comes and some of the work that I'm doing. And we today. can we can talk about sure. that uh, also. But it's I mean it's a fascinating journey that has taken, and it's like the journey of your father, four times immigrant, uh, Mohajir as we call it, um, in the different circumstances, and every time packing, unpacking, starting afresh. Whether this was Libya or Kuwait or Jordan, and it's it's like being a serial founder that you have to found yourself 
or found, um, you know, in a new country. So mm-hmm. I think this is a good training for that. And your mother also being a found, being a founder, being an entrepreneur. So uh, the f- thing that comes to my mind is that you, were you the chief operating officer of your family? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the image that I can think about. You young <laughs> person, I, I, kind I, of managing everything. Making I, sure I think at some happen. level, I don't think I had the authority to manage everything. Yeah, <laughs> but I was keenly aware, <laughs> listening to the different uh, positive and negative ways of doing things. Yeah. And the importance of pers- perseverance, yes. right? Because you're not going to get things right all the time. You will fail, you will fall, but you have to get up. And unfortunately, my father's entrepreneurship journey was forced entrepreneurship. If you didn't work, yeah. you didn't put food on the table. I mean, you don't, there are no jobs. Basically. You really don't have much of a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think what really influenced me at that stage in my life was listening taking in some of the lessons learned uh, from the family. Uh, And my uncle was a big success and I worked with him during the summers. I was very curious to understand. I I worked on a telex machine. I don't know if you remember, but it was, I thought it was so super cool that there was this ticker tape thing that you would type and it would be received someplace else. This was before the fax days and then the fax days came in and it was incredible to see what technology happened, you know, through email and then uh, further through that. I was fascinated at communicating at being able to connect with people. My, my, my uncle is a trader. You know, he got uh, sugar and rice from different parts of the world and distributed and packaged it in Jordan. You know, and the idea to you know, uh, tie in different parts of the globe yeah. to be able to create commerce, to be able to create wealth, to be able to invest. You know, it was uh, in, in my years of, of coming back to the Middle East because I was in Canada and I spent significant time there. I thought to myself, how can I impact people the most? Do I go to Africa and try to work in a camp? You know, do we? Do I try to do something? How can I most use my talent, who I am, where I grew up, the language that I have to be able to help people? And when I met Fadi, it was a no-brainer. If you are able to uh, uh, provide financing and uh, uh, money investments yeah. to people that are creating, you know, jobs and trickling down that impact to several families, several hundred families, it's an incredible thing to do. So, yes, uh, it's, it started from humble no, that, beginnings. <laughs> and absolutely, and I think there's something about the Levant region, and I think it's because there's so many wars and people have been uprooted, Syrian and uh, Jordanian, Lebanese and Palestinian, I mean, they're some of the best entrepreneurs in the region. Uh, unfortunately, these countries are, because they're not that stable, so they are, are in Chile go out, so the Correct. very successful uh, Kuwaiti entrepreneurs are, 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 are Palestinian, you'd find very successful Lebanese entrepreneurs in Nigeria, apparently in Latin America, you know, Carlos Slim, is a, a Lebanese origin Correct. and there is an El Palestino uh, football club in somewhere in Latin America which, <laughs> which uh, of course is a, a rooting for Palestine so I think it's fa- fantastic and it tells you about your personal story but also story of people the, the the tribe that you belong to or the region that you belong to and how you've gotten and it shows a story of progress and that's very interesting uh, that how it has progressed where you are today but along the way I see that you did this band and hustling, I would call it, you said aggressive marketing. So would would it be correct to call you the Beatles of venture capital in the Middle East? <laughs> <laughs> Beatles were successful at a very early age and they got a huge fan base wherever yeah, they yeah, went. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, in the Middle East, we don't go to the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was able- Would you like to be known as the Beatles of the Middle East? Um, <laughs> the venture capital of the Middle East? I mean, yeah, so who wouldn't want <laughs> who to be as successful to, as the Beatles of the Middle East? Um, yes, I think, I think the multiple business avenues and the scope of going into things like uh, yoga, like music, uh, starting several businesses, having female entrepreneurs surround me and understanding the balance that is needed to raise a family and also run a corporation and also deal with the stigma of maybe society that may or may not accept female entrepreneurs. It's really the story of the underdog. Mm. It's the story of somebody who needs to hustle, who needs to think outside of the box and create opportunity for survival. This is not, you know, I'm f- I have free time I have and I have nothing Lifestyle better business, to do. Yes. And let me think of something. It's, it's something that really drives you 
and you need to find a path of success. And it's okay if you fail. And it's okay if it doesn't last forever, it only lasts for five or 10 years, and then you think of something else and you move on. That's really been my story, which was a story of experimentation. You know, my love was in music, but I had to let that go at some level. However, I've learned a lot from that journey, and I took those lessons to be able to talk to lawyers, to be able to negotiate things, you know, to be able to make sure that my band partners are part of my family or my executive team that I'm also taking care of and, and have a, a duty towards so that I can get them to where they need to go. So I think this experimentation helped me in my investments, helped me understand the founder's perspective and what they have to battle through. I think the idea of venture capitalists, you know, being entrepreneur friendly cannot be just lip service. Mm. It has to be something that is felt and ingrained and appreciated because when you fund these companies and you understand the difficulty and the pressure that these entrepreneurs have to do. They have to feed their family. They have to deal with uh, hiring. They have to deal with firing. Mm. They have to make very difficult uh, uh, decisions. They have a fiduciary duty for their investors along with their employees and themselves. It's a lot to take on. The idea of being an entrepreneur is cool today, and thank God we got to a place where it's great, it's great, where you have business plan competitions and people go and they win all of these awards for being entrepreneur of the year and all of these different things. But the reality of it is there's a lot of hard work and a lot of people that have a lot of faith in you and it's very difficult to fail and sometimes it's a very lonely place. Mm. Being an entrepreneur is very difficult. Very difficult, you only know. So the. The side of me, I think, that really helped me is how I uh, help entrepreneurs uh, through mentorship. Someone to talk to, someone that they can uh, benchmark some of their successes and failures. How am I doing? What should I do? Where shall I go? This is my dilemma. Where do I go? And if I can give them any sign of hope yeah. or clarity along their way, I think it comes a lot. Or way. belief, a belief in them. Uh, you know, that's sometimes, that's what's, what's needed. So we have something in common, uh, which is that right at the birth, so, so you were at day zero of venture, not even venture capital, venture, which is Aman and um, uh, Maktoub and all of these uh, companies being funded. So I um, got lucky to be in Amman in 2010, right after Maktoub uh, was born, uh, was exited, and it was bubbling. There was Oasis 500, if you remember, there was the Endeavor uh, J uh, um, uh, Jordan that had become, you know, very, very active. And so I experienced that, and my break in Amman, as I had worked mostly in London, was also through um, our mutual um, admiration, Mr. Uh, Fadi Gandur. Uh, so we have that thing in common Fantastic. that Fadi was also very instrumental in helping me get into the Middle East uh, through Riyadh Ventures. Khaldun Tabaza Tabaga sure. was, uh, I worked with him in Jordan uh, and I experienced that and I think that was fantastic. And so working with Fadi, who's highly energetic person and in a way visionary, because if you think about it, Vamda as a content portal was years ahead of its time. I, I think, uh, I mean, Venture Power Partners or even Vamda uh, is, was years ahead of his time when nobody else was talking about it. And also very much what the region needed because you talked about the Arab Spring. I think one element of Arab Spring that had to change was jobs because government public sector could not create the jobs. Uh, so new jobs had to be created which engaged the youth and that could only come from technology or startups. So there had to be a new economic model. Yes. And there it was warmed up both as a portal and as a cap, as a, as a, as a venture firm yes. uh, 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 being that. So what are the, uh, some of the things, he was a very holistic thinker and I would imagine that yes. he was. What are some of the other learnings that you had experiences share with us from working with Fadi that, that you've taken because you worked with him for 10 years. Yes. Um, he really walks the talk. Very few people are able to do that. I think uh, if anybody uh, uh, appreciates, uh, Fadi wakes up very early. <laughs> Fadi is extremely healthy. He's extremely sportive. Yes. <laughs> uh, he <laughs> loves diving. He loves swimming. He loves nature. And, you know, for somebody who's looking at the venture capital world and looking at the business world, there's a human side of all of this where it all starts. Somebody who takes care of himself, who is completely conscious, aware, uh, loves the, the simple things and the finer things in life. You know, you could be uh, somebody as, as, as you know, uh, uh, financially able, 
but live a completely hedonistic lifestyle or not take care of uh, certain things, what really I learned from Fadi is his humbleness, his ability to be uh, consciously aware of his well-being, um, and always receptive to those that are around him. And I think I love that. And I've used that in my own model, where I need to be the best version of myself in order to serve or else I'm no good for anybody <laughs> around me. And I'm, I was constantly pushed to meet the incredible standards that Fadi has for himself. He's yeah. the first person in the office. Wow. He's the last person that leaves. He's the one that is constantly into meetings, constantly doing things. It's almost as if he doesn't sleep and he's tireless uh, in doing what he does. His pursuit is a, a labor of love and passion. And his ability to then couple that with uh, Ruwad, which is his uh, uh, enterprise, social enterprise, correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. social enterprise, bringing private enterprises to come and invest in the community that has an impact. You know, it's this holistic side of things that that really spoke to me more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a human behind it. Mm -hmm. There's a conscious, aware human that is uh, manifesting and driving this. Mm -hmm. And his ability to create new ideas and to be at the forefront of everything that's happening and be so highly regarded by all of his peers and all of his employees is something that is absolutely fantastic. Um, so that spoke to me very, very loud. I was so proud to be able to be uh, close to the aura mm -hmm. of somebody like that mm -hmm. and to be able to take these positive uh, uh, traits mm -hmm. and adapt it into my own life. Amazing, um, And that's where my love for mentorship and my love for helping entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs, male entrepreneurs, um, understanding the human side of things, mm -hmm. because that's what I really got from Fadi. And what you've told me, consciousness, being holistic, uh, humility, it, it's, it's fascinating and it's even miracle that it's there given you know how competitive he is. And you have to be to get to that level and what the achievement is. Because no, nobody gives you, the world doesn't give you anything on a platter. You have to fight for it. So be able to be able to be that competitive and that focus on the objective. And yet, you said something very interesting, doesn't have any enemies or uh, everyone who talks very well about it. That is near impossible mm -hmm. uh, to achieve that. And I think that's uh, that, that would be fascinating um, uh, kind of insight into, you know, the, probably the rock star Richard Branson of the region, I would say, um, yep. because he's... He's, he's been like that. Uh, you talked about being an entrepreneur is like being an underdog. So tell us a bit. And, and we have, of course, you talked about women entrepreneurs, women founders. And we have one thing, another thing in common that you have three sisters and I have three sisters. <laughs> yeah. And of course, that makes us more sensitive sure. towards uh, um, the, the, the women and, and their plight and their challenges. Uh, and uh, also, incidentally, all the f uh, companies that we have backed are also uh, founded by uh, women, uh, uh, women entrepreneurs. So talk us about the kind kind of underdog challenges that uh, founders face in the Middle East, the system drag, uh, what prevents them from scaling. You mentioned there isn't a, a unicorn since then. What is there? Why hasn't it happened? It's, a, it's an underdog David Goliath kind of situation. Yeah, I think, you know, we touched how entrepreneurship is challenging mm. because, you know, there's so much on your plate that you have to do. Yeah. But then being an entrepreneur in an emerging market, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Nigeria, you know, that's a whole different <laughs> level of yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because again, you're not building something where you know I'm going to get acquired. You know, if I do this, my acquirers are available. I know where I can offload this. You know, I only have to suffer for five years and then I'll get to where I need to go. Here, you have a, a foundational you know, non-existence of logistics, of fintech, of payment, of 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 the way that your consumers uh, expect things or or get things done. Uh, it's a broken model. We have a lot to do in the Middle East and in emerging markets, which means you can't just copy and paste models that you see successful elsewhere. You know, I remember a lot of valuations of companies. They used to come to me and and want to be valued on the number of users that they had or the number of eyeballs that they got, yeah. or the number of downloads that they have. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean anything in our part of the world as, uh, you know, taking it as a, a benchmark to what Silicon Valley has or Europe has. Because here, cash is king. 
meaning you need to be able to create revenues, meaning you're not necessarily going to get successive rounds of funding mm -hmm. and you're going to be not profitable for the next 10 years and still try to get the kind of exits that you have. Mm -hmm. The reality of the situation is that funding in emerging markets is much more difficult. Yeah. Acquiring your talent is difficult. Acquiring your customers is difficult. difficult. Keeping them and retaining them is very difficult. Getting your services to be uh, uh, provided at the right time, at the right standard that you want is difficult. You don't find the marketing agency that you want. You don't find the customer service that you want. You don't, I mean, wow. it's, it's, so the, the DNA of an entrepreneur in emerging markets means that they have to think several layers deep and try to take care of so many different things other than the fact that you know, they have to keep their family happy and they have to feed them and, you know, they may have to make sure that there's enough salary at the end of the month to pay everybody. Uh, and they have to deal with their investors that are nagging on their heads as well. Uh, they also have to be able to really understand that to keep this business alive in emerging markets means that you have to be creative, means that you have to do a lot more work. So I would say problem solving on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is one of the key characteristics that uh, uh, an entrepreneur needs to have. I think today, entrepreneurs that are not empathetic, that do not have a level of understanding, that cannot problem solve both internally and externally, um, will not be able to have a smooth ride. You know, they might be successful for a few months, and we have a lot of startups that are the flavor of the month or a bubble that, you know, everybody goes through FOMO and starts throwing money at somebody. But if they don't have a concrete business model, if they are not a great leader where they inspire people and people look up to them and they're able to take care of their employees and their stakeholders, it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. What we've seen in emerging markets is a lot of people coming into the entrepreneurship world making a, a big buzz about something, probably making some money, but then going bust very, very fast. As fast as they went up, is e they went down even faster. Mm -hmm. And I think it talks about the resilience and the ability of an entrepreneur to have the characters that is required to be able to sustain and to be able to grow and to be able to build businesses. I would say the most successful entrepreneurs in emerging markets today are ones that have prior experience in scaling companies. You know, they're the ones that, you know, for example, the founder of Tabi, Hussam Arab, he came uh, into uh, uh, building his thing from being in Namshi and being in the fashion world and looking at, you know, companies that have scaled mm. and understanding what it means. What it takes. So that they can then go out and build their own thing and mm. become successful. So the DNA of failing fast, failing forward, failing and understanding and learning and coming in again and reiterating, I, I would think is a much better bet than a first time founder. I have no problems with first time founders and we invested with first time founders all the time. But it's those characteristics, that resilience, that ability to take the punches and fail and move forward, which really, um, which really sets apart the failures from the successes in emerging markets specifically. Very interesting. And, um, you know, I call it system track. So a lot of time is spent trying to resolve the systematic issues yeah. which drag you. So yeah. you're not focusing on growth, which you would do if you were in the West yeah. uh, or the US, but you're focusing on just getting those things that weigh you down. So I, um, there's a very, very famous founder. Uh, he owns big real estate development company. So he has got this building and he said, look, you know what? I own this building, but I run the entire municipality of the, around this building, including the cleaning, yeah. the security, the traffic, because True. if I don't do that, my building will not operate. So, True. so you know, as a founder, you need to not only solve your problem, the problem that you're solving, you have to solve the problem supply chain, the route to market and everything around it. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, taxing thing. And of course, if you're battle hardened, if you have worked uh, before and seen it uh, yep. somewhere else, then that works. What about teams? Because teams is not something that in our culture we do well. You know, at least at least in Pakistan, it's not stable teams. Uh, deep teams are not there. Founding teams are not there. And for that kind of heavy operational yep. 
uh, work, you need one person cannot do it. What has been your experience? Is there any rule of thumb you have in terms of investing the yes. minimum number of founding teams that you're looking at? Yeah. Tell us about your experience. I mean, teams are essential. You you have to be able to have your load be supported by others that you trust mm. in order to get to where you need to go. So what we find a lot is, you know, we have a developer that comes up, uh, is great at UI UX, has developed, you know, an algorithm, for example, that has been patented and they're very excited about it and they want to change the world, but they have no marketing or business experience. And what happens is they become very myopic in the way that they do things and they see things. And us coming as venture capitalists from a business sense, we are saying, you know, that's great. But what that doesn't matter to us how beautiful your UI and UX looks like and what the uh, uh, operations of your algorithm does. If you don't have clients that are willing to pay for this, and if you're not scaling, then you really don't have a business. Uh -huh. So the ability to un identify your own skill set identify the gaps that you have that you need yeah you know whether you're the programmer or the developer whether you're the CTO if you need someone in operations if you need someone in marketing you know if you need uh, uh, someone to run the company and if you can't do it uh, that is necessary and I would say the majority of my experience has been based on founding teams and the ability of the founder to find the best talent possible to take them to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. The story of Kareem was that. Yes. You know, the story of Suit was that. All of the exits that we saw in the region had two things in common. Incredible teams and the ability to scale mm -hmm. because that's what really creates value uh, uh, for the company and then leads to exits. So it's difficult in our culture sometimes to trust yes. or to give the baton to somebody who probably can execute better than you. Mm. But again, it's that sense of humility, it's that sense of understanding and doing what's best for the company. I've also been uh, part of boards where founders, co-founders, that loved each other and were like brothers or sisters uh, and grew this, this fantastic company, fought. And mm. when you have co-founders that fight, mm. It's the recipe of disaster yeah. because everything hinges on that, which, you know, indirectly shows you how important these teams are, you know, and how important to have difficult conversations very early on so that if any problems arise, which they will, as the company grows in value and as more money come in and more investors want to give you money, all of a sudden you start thinking about yourself in a different way and you want more equity or you don't want to take the company in a certain strategic direction you know, these things uh, falter. So I found something that lacks in the emerging markets and something that I work very hard on, which is the governments, governance side of things and the compliance side of things, the structure of the company. You know, back in my dad's days, and I think uh, the generation before us, maybe there wasn't a lot of structure in at least the Middle Eastern markets. But now, you know, building boards, reporting, auditing, you know, making sure that you have a track record, uh, compliance and governance, and, you know, having healthy habits when it comes to the uh, picking your board members and voting on things. This is essential. It's an essential lifeline for the company as it moves forward and grows. And it's something that I think we're still learning. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you don't have those structures in place, the demise of the company happens much, much faster. So that is all about teamwork. Yes. It may not be necessarily the people you uh, employ, but it's the people that you have around you, which is also part of your teamwork, which is also necessary for the entrepreneur to pick who their investors are. Sometimes there's a good fit, sometimes there's a bad fit. Just because somebody gives you money doesn't mean that that's the right fit. The right fit Especially on the early days, if you have a rich uncle that comes and gives you money, mm -hmm. but takes 51% of the company, that may not be a good no, fit for your future. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <It's not laughs> so you really have to be very aware and you're not going to have good days every day. As, an, as a founder, you're going to have some you know, days where you're not going to be able to take care of everything yourself. So you need to be able to pass the buck to somebody else that you can trust, that can keep the company alive until you rejuvenate and come back again. We're not super people, we're not super men and super women. We, nobody expects us to be in our A game 24 hours a day. No, you need people to support you 
it's a fact. And I think one has to realize that the company is changing and so is the enterprise, the venture is changing and so should you be changing. As, this, as someone said, uh, there is no such thing as a great CEO of a venture. There is something called a great CEO for the next 18 months. So, so if you're doing well, the venture has changed so much in the 18 True. months that you probably, the kind of person you are, you need to either change or you need to make space for someone else. True. Uh, and, and that will only happen if you are less emotional, much more objective, and also, uh, you know, humble, as you said. Um, and, and that is something that I think founders have to learn and they yeah. have to come with experience. I, I want to talk a little bit more about honesty. Yeah. Okay. Because I feel a lot of founders want to only portray the beautiful picture. And when they're going through trouble, maybe they don't want to come and air out their dirty laundry to you. Mm -hmm. They don't want to come and tell you that you're in trouble. And actually what happens is it limits your support team, so, your investors, mm -hmm. to step in and help you until it's too late. Yeah. And I think also culturally speaking, uh, to abil the ability to uh, you know, not take things personally when it comes to challenges, that things do go bad sometimes, yeah. The faster you're able to communicate them and, and ask for help, either through mentorship, either to your board, either to people that you look up to, it's a survival mechanism. And I think people might be falsely under the awareness of, I need to do everything perfectly myself, and I cannot show my investors that I'm faltering or my team that I'm faltering. Actually, that's the wrong approach to take. And from my experience, I've seen way too many founders take way too much upon their own shoulders, and they only were able to open up and say things were bad when they could not pay salaries and they could not have any cash left. Yeah, too late. And that's too late. That's too late. So really, you know, being open, being transparent, and being honest, I think is also a key characteristic for many of the founders. And so to now coming back to China, so what are the lessons you said that you know you learned from China? Is China really a transferable thing? It's a huge market. The infrastructure, tech infrastructure is very up there um, in terms of payments and everything. Uh, but And consumer internet is a huge part of the success story over there. So is really the skills of China transferable or, 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 or the market of China or lessons from there transferable across to Middle East? But I would like to know. Yeah, so that's a core tenant or a core thesis of what MSA does and what I do. Yeah. We honestly think that we have a crystal ball that we can foretell which models will <laughs> scale okay. and which models will not scale. It's very valuable, worth billion dollars itself. The reason why we think we have that is yeah. because China has gone through stars, they've gone through COVID, uh -huh. they've been able to see almost at an accelerated rate how people consume technology, how they use technology, how businesses thrive with technology. So these are business models that have succeeded through the test of time and through very challenging times. We think that this, these playbooks, these technologies, are very much transferable into emerging markets for, for many, many reasons. The way that China builds its technology is bit by bit, step by step, little by little, yeah. which means you can take things apart and they make sense for emerging markets. Emerging markets, somebody's not going to necessarily buy a year long subscription. People don't have that kind of uh, liquidity, but they're willing to buy bits and pieces as they move along the ladder. China has created an environment where they will lead you with very high frequency, low, uh, 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 low cost uh, to get you onboarded onto a platform and then sell you all sorts of services based on that. This is the kind of model that we found works in emerging markets, you know, where it's not the US one size fits all. It's not take a big subscription. It's not the Apple model. It's not. It's a step by step model that gets you into uh, a platform and then upsells you as you need to go step by step. So it's a very manageable model. So we invest with a China lens, meaning uh, mobile first Chinese models that have scaled successfully. We look at gaming, we look at fintech, we look at B2B enterprises. So somebody in the Middle East or in emerging markets might come up with a great idea but it hasn't been tested. It could be great for a short period of time, but if that model has not 
been tested with the test of time, it's not something that we necessarily would uh, invest in. So, for example, we haven't yet seen the kind of uh, uh, innovation in green tech, clean tech, med tech, yes. and ed tech. Uh, yes. There are a lot of funds in the region that invest in that, and I, I understand that, and we need investments in these specific verticals, but we haven't seen the kind of innovation and the kind of scale that kind of makes sense in, in these specific uh, industries. So, therefore, we have a team in China one of my partners uh, uh, was responsible for scaling Mobike into emerging markets. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of feel we have an idea of what the technology, the DNA, and the scalability of these companies must look like yes. in order to be successful. Okay. And we will invest in these, uh, uh, in these uh, uh, models. Mm. We invest in Latin America, we invest in Southeast Asia and Africa. In Latin America, you have a lot of US VCs that come and invest, invest in them. But in. when they hear that you are a Chinese lineage VC, they tell you, I want to be the mate one of X country. I want to be the Alipay of X country. They're not using US models. US examples. Okay. They are using Chinese examples. Mm -hmm. So it shows you that the world is aware of what is happening in China mm -hmm. and want to be able to replicate that. Mm -hmm. We don't think that there's enough uh, a VC and knowledge that is coming out of China and we feel like we are pioneering this. Mm -hmm. So far that thesis has worked very well both with our investors and with our entrepreneurs. So I think there is kind of a, a differentiator that MSA has that is very unique for this region and for global emerging markets that we are taking forward in our in our uh, investment mandate and so far it's been it's been interesting you know we've been able to get the capital we want we've been able to attract excellent companies to invest in and i think it's really something that is very unique you know, I was in uh, Silicon Valley. I did a fellowship over there uh, in 2017-18. And one of the person, well, they said, why are you here? So you're from Pakistan. Why are you here? You should be in China. The price point, the technology, the scrappiness, the entrepreneurship that you're going to face over there is something which is more relevant uh, to countries like Pakistan and Indonesia, where, where Silicon Valley is really high-end technology. We may not be ready for that. So definitely, I think China does offer it, at least the technology side or um, and the market um, pilot uh, of things that can be that can be successful. So wrapping this up. So what are uh, two questions linked together? What is the venture startup crisis that people are not seeing that might happen in the future? Mm. What do you think? Mm. Um, a that's the problem question. Mm. Is there something long range or something? Everything is looking hunky dory at the moment. Mm. A lot of capital, but what do you think? Long range is emerging, which could be a problem. Um, and lastly, what would it take for another Kareem, uh, uh, another um, you know billion dollar exit to happen in the Middle East? What needs to change? Founders, investors, government. All, all those levels. Great. Uh, first, let me take a step back and say, you know, I'm filled with gratitude for being able to be a part of the story mm. um, of the evolution of venture capital in, in the region. Um, this is an incredible time. We've never had as much capital. We've never had as much interest from governments and corporates and, and angel investors um, to invest in technology. You know, if you were an entrepreneur in 2015 or, or 2005, mm -hmm. <laughs> today's a very, very different world. Yeah. You have a lot of options yes. and you have a lot of things that you can uh, do and a lot of support. So I'm, I'm humble and I'm, I'm filled with gratitude in terms of where the ecosystem has come in a very short period of time. And I think we still have a long way to go, clearly, but it's lovely to have the kind of uh, support, especially the sovereign support, to come in uh, uh, and move things forward. Um, I don't think things are hunky-dory today. <laughs> I think we went through COVID uh, kind of shocked, you know, a worldwide pandemic. I think uh, it demolished a lot of businesses and it helped a lot of businesses. That was the first kind of awakening call uh, for the region. Of course, there's a lot of awakening calls because we're politically unstable, but um, there is that. We also have, um, you know, big shocks when it comes to a bank like Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. that over that weekend, you know, 95% of our employees and our portfolio companies did not sleep mm -hmm. because how could something that you take for granted, like a bona fide banking system, potentially go bankrupt? and you lose all the hard work that you've done and your livelihood is you know in question 
literally overnight. Yes. So uh, the financial crisis that's happening right now means if you look at the statistics and the data, I think the amount of uh, investment that has happened in Q1 2023 is at an all time low after we've seen year after year of increased amounts of investment quarter over quarter. So it's not hunky dory today. It's very difficult to get capital. Uh, I think the bubble that we saw in terms of valuations go up, especially in Pakistan with what happened with airlift, airlift and yeah. others. Uh, today, there's a sobering moment for entrepreneurs and for VCs in this in this uh, ecosystem and in this asset class, I think it's important. It's important that we start to understand that business goes through cycles yeah. of up and down. Yes. And as you have no hair or gray hair, <laughs> you start to- We have another commonality. <laughs> that these cycles go up and down and we need to be able to persevere through them. So yeah. I think there needs to be a longer term view you know, you can't have people come in and, and think that, you know, they're going to make a quick buck uh, out of this. So there's that humbling long-term view that needs to come into place. Two, I'm worried about, you know, these bubbles that come in. There's a lot of cash, especially in KSA. Uh, people come in and then there's major failure because the business models are not concrete enough. The teams are not concrete enough. Uh, what I'm afraid of is some of these bigger companies dying, eliminating international capital, such as the Tigers and Sequoias that came and started to play around a little bit, but then all of a sudden, you know, went back because they went into companies that sounded great, yeah, but, but weren't actually functional. And then we have companies that are listing either through SPACs or otherwise also not doing great because the fundamentals of business are not there. Mm. So this new generation that's coming in that thinks that they can get things easy because there's a lot of capital, I think is a false belief and I think will not serve us well. Uh, clearly, this is all growing pains as part of the evolution of the ecosystem. But my fear is we're going to scare people away. You know, people that were bullish about Egypt and Pakistan and the Middle East and all of a sudden, you know, are shocked about what's happening. There needs to be patience. You know, yes. these are you know, long tail plays. There's the bottom of the pyramid that needs the kind of technology and support and investment that we are doing. Yeah but it's not gonna happen overnight and you're gonna have a lot of ups and downs with hopefully a positive trend that's going to move forward. So I think, you know, the sense of urgency mm -hmm. has to calm down. People need to have patience. There needs to be governance and compliance. We need to build, you know, very stable foundations and structures in order to win the race in the long run and not look at a very short-term idealistic view of things. That was very insightful. And thank you, Walid, for your time. I think we got a big, um, a very quick whirlwind tour of both your personal life, um, but also uh, of Middle East venture space and going to China, going to the US, and then coming back here and what the future holds for um, for venture capital. So there uh, comes the uh, another episode of the alchemy of venture creation what it takes to build successful entities and i think what we what we heard from the story that goes from um uh, kuwait to libya to montreal comes back to dubai and then goes now towards china uh, is a fascinating story and it tells you that old business principles are still important positive unit economics is still important uh, somehow technology doesn't change that cash is still important your cfo and your treasurer your your product manager is very important, but make sure you hire a good CFO and a treasurer because that's going to determine how you use your cash. And that has been throughout the region. That's what's what's important. So those are the important things that haven't changed. But on top of that, of course, one has to be very humble because the capital comes and somehow you feel that you have the magical touch. But when the capital goes away, you also the magical touch goes away. And then you should realize that basic fundamentals cannot uh, of the business if are there. Uh, then where the capital comes or slows down or goes are still uh, uh, your business will still succeed. And lastly, I think MSA is very unique. This region has had a lot of American view perspective of everything from policy um, uh, to, to investment and to businesses. And I think there is 
a new power emerging um, in the east and that's china and i think it will be very interesting to see how their venture capital and investing model can apply to Middle East. And I think MSA and Valid are spearheading uh, that charge in getting uh, learning from China and applying uh, to the Middle East region. So that was a fascinating and very insightful discussion. And we look forward to joining us uh, on the next episode of Alchemy of Transformation. Thank you.